What's going on everyone? My name is Hunter and welcome to a brand new Svelkit video. In today's video, we're going to be learning how to implement form validation in Svelkit using Zod, which is an open source schema validation library. As usual, I prepared a good starting point for us, which you can find in the starter branch of the repo link below. And we just have the markup and styles for a basic registration form that we're going to be validating. It's styled using Daisy UI and Tailwind CSS. So with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started by checking out the Zod documentation. So we're going to be using Zod, which is a schema declaration and validation library. And if we scroll down here a bit, we can see how it's actually used. You can see that we install it with npm install Zod, which if you're using the starter repository, then you already have it in your package.json. You just need to run npm install. And then if we scroll down here a bit, we can see that we have a basic usage example. And we can see that they start off by importing Z from Zod or Z, however you want to pronounce Z. And then they define a schema. So they say const my schema equals Z dot string. So we're creating a schema for strings. And then what we can do is we can run my schema dot parse and then pass a value into that. So in this case, they passed in tuna. This is fine. This doesn't error out. But since they passed in a number here, it throws an error. Now we're more interested in creating an object schema because our form data is going to be an object. So you can see here that they defined a user, which is a z.object. And then they're able to define all the properties that align with their user, for example, and then set the respective types and minimum requirements here. And then they're able to run user.parse, pass in another object, and then it will either throw an error or return the user as expected. So let's go ahead and take a look at how we can implement this with our form. So if we come into our source folder here and then we go into routes and we go to page.server.js, we can see that we have a default action here that's currently just console logging the form data. So when I click submit register here on this form, let me go to my actual console, you'll see that we have name, email, password, and password confirm. And then if we check this terms and conditions box, we're gonna have name, email, password, password confirm, and we have terms says on. And on is the default value that's passed for a checkbox if you don't specify something else, okay? So we're getting all that information into our action here. Now let's go ahead and set up our Zod schema so that we can start to validate some of this data. So we're gonna import Z from Zod, and then we're gonna define a register schema. It's a Z.object, and then we're gonna create an object. So we're gonna say, we're gonna have obviously name, and then the name is gonna be a z.string. And let's just say that we want it to be a minimum of one character, which means that they have to pass something here. It can't be an empty string. And let's just say the maximum is gonna be 64, for example. And then we wanna trim the end, which is trim off the white space from the end of the string. And I'm getting all of these methods here. If you look at the Zod documentation, you scroll down, you'll see that they have strings listed here that have a handful of string, um, string specific validations. And there's also validator.js, which has a bunch of other useful string validation functions that we can use. So I'm getting all of this here. So please refer to the documentation. It has a ton of information for things that might be useful for your specific data. Uh, but let's move on to the email. So we know that email is going to be z.string. It's also going to have a minimum of one. We'll set a maximum of 64 as well here. And then we'll also say email. Now we don't need to run trim on an email because it just does that by default. It parses out the email from that string and we'll remove any white space from the end. So now with this object here, let's go ahead and run a test run with our register form. Even though we don't have all the fields here, I just wanna show you what this also does. So what we need to do is inside of our action, we need to set up a try catch block because this is gonna throw an error if we mess up with our validation. So we'll say const results equals register schema dot parse, and we'll pass in our form data object just like this, right? And then we want to console log, if it passes, we're going to console log success, and then we'll also console log the result. And if it fails the validation, we'll say console log error. We'll take a look at that, okay? So let's go ahead and run this first with nothing. So if we click register, we're going to see that we get a bunch of things, but what we really care about is down here at the issues. And we can see that we get a few messages that relate to each one of the fields. And it says that the string must contain at least one characters. And this, ar this path array here is actually the field that it maps to. And we'll see that here in just a few seconds. But it's giving us errors back, okay, for each one of the fields that we've defined validation for. So what if we just type in name and email? And then we register. You can see we get success and then we get the object, right? But if you recall, we actually passed in a bunch of other things. We passed in an empty string password, an empty pa confirmed password. So it actually strips those out. So if something is not specified here, it will get stripped out of the return object by default. 
right? Unless we can say that the field is required or it's optional. So let's go ahead and define our passwords now. And we're gonna build off of this and add some additional error messaging and then learn how to get it on the front end as well here in just a second. So let's just say the password is gonna be a string. It's gonna be a minimum of, of eight characters. We'll just use six here and then a maximum of 32. And then we also wanna trim off white space from this. And then the confirm password or password confirm will be the same because these should be the same exact values, right? And then for our terms, right, since we get that on, what we can do is we can say z.enum, and then we can pass in an enum, and we're only gonna have one option here, and it's just gonna be on. But if you had multiple, they could be listed like this, or on or off, for example, right? We're only looking for on, so if it doesn't have on, we want to reject that, right? We're gonna throw an error. So let's save this here, and let's fill out our form, and let's not accept the terms and conditions. And you see that we get an error, expected on right? And it's required. So let's do it successfully. All right. It was successful. We get our object back just as we expect. And then we could use this object to go in, you know, create a new database object or do whatever, whatever we were planning on doing with that object in the first place. But now let's look at making this more user-friendly, right? Because right now the user has no idea what's happening when this validation is going on behind the scenes. They have no idea what's wrong. Of course, we could show some type of error message here on the screen, but right now it's just showing some, you know, required message, right? And that doesn't really help them um, or let's say the string is is must be at least one character. That doesn't really tell them what, what string needs to be one character, okay? So what we can do is we can actually go into each individual one of these methods and we can define specific messages that will be shown if that is triggered, right? If an error is triggered from that, me that method. So we can go into string, for example, and we can set up something called a required error, which basically means if this is not passed, so if a, if a value, if this property is not passed into that schema, then this message will be displayed. So we'll say required error and we'll say name is required. And then for minimum, we can pass in a message and say name must be at least one character. And actually for this one, we'll just say name is required because in, really, in reality, if they don't pass anything here, if they don't pass at least one character, then they didn't pass anything, which we could just say it's required as well. And then for the max, we can say name must be less than 64 characters. Okay, and then for email, we'll do the same thing. We'll say required error. Email is required for the minimum Maximum, say, email must be less than 64 characters. And then we'll say email must be a valid email address, okay? Now for password, again, we can do the same thing here. Okay, so we went ahead and set up all of our custom messages here. I didn't want to bore you with watching me type all of these in, but let me change this back to password confirm because I copy and pasted this like a cheater. And we could see that now we have nice messages here for each one of these validations that gets triggered. So if, if the minimum is less than one, it's going to tell us that it's required because they didn't pass anything in. If it's greater than 64, it's going to tell us that it has to be less than 64. So this is what these are the messages that you want to display back to the client or on the user interface side, right? What we can do is inside of our actions, as you can see, when we trigger an error, we get this pretty big object here with a bunch of nested arrays for the paths. What we want to do is we want to flatten this a bit. And Zod has documentation on this. If you look at their error handling documentation, which I believe is, they have a full page dedicated to it here. I will be able to see that we're able to flatten errors. We come down here we can see that we now just get form errors and field errors. And the field errors have the property that we pass through it. So for example, in our case, it would be name, password, email, password confirm with the with an array of the errors that it generated mapped to that property. So let's go ahead and do that and let's show you real quick what that's gonna look like. So instead of just console logging error, let's console log error.flatten. And now let's resubmit our form, just blank. So as you can see, this is already looking much better. We have an array for each one of our fields, our form fields, and all the different error messages that this generated are listed here. So what we can do is if we just say Hunter, for example, we're gonna lose that field error name because it doesn't have any errors anymore, right? So we're only gonna return back the errors that we receive. So what we can do is we can actually pass these into our client side. And if you haven't seen my form actions in Svelte video, definitely go check that out. It'll definitely be a good prerequisite to this. But what we can do is we can actually pull field errors out of this object here. And we'll say const field errors. 
and we're going to rename that to errors equals error dot flatten, right? And then what we want to do is we want to rip out the password and the con password confirm. So it's best practice to not return the password back to the client if they're registering or, or putting in sensitive information, for example. If they have a validation error, we want them to retype in their password and their confirmed password. So one of the easiest ways to strip out passwords or strip out values from an object, we can just say, con or I'm sorry, const password, password confirm, dot, 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 rest equals form data. And the reason we're doing form data here is because we want to return back the values they had in their fields before with the updated validation messages, right? So we want to give them everything except for the password and the password confirm. So essentially what this destructuring is doing is we're taking the password, password confirm out, and then everything else or the rest is in here instead of this rest variable, right? And we can obviously rename this to whatever we want. It doesn't have to be rest. This is just a common way to do it. So then what we can do is we can return data as rest and errors. And that's going to give us access to not only the errors, but also the values that were passed in the form field so that they can make their corrections without having to redo everything from scratch, right? So now let's go into our page.svelte, which contains our form, and we will accept that form prop. So we'll say export let form, which is going to contain everything that we returned from the action here. So now let's begin to update our UI to show those validation messages. And we're also going to change the border of our inputs to red when a validation error occurs, okay? So since we have access to this form prop here, we're also gonna have access to the errors, which means we're also gonna have access to those field errors, which are .name, .email, and so on and so forth, right? So what we can do is inside of our labels, we make this a bit bigger here. As you can see, we have a span class, which has the label validation label listed here, and it's hidden at the moment. So we're gonna actually remove hidden from this one for now. It was just hidden because I wanted to already have it here when we needed it. So we're going to say we're going to say if form dot errors dot name that we want to show this validation label, and then what we actually want to show from this though is going to be the form dot errors dot name, and then the first value from that array. So if you recall, we were actually receiving an array back for the error messages, and we want to get the first one of that array. You could obviously run an each block here and loop through all the errors and show them stack, but for this example, we're just going to show the first message. Okay. So let's go ahead and save this. And then I'll just go ahead and submit this form empty again. And you'll see that we do in fact get name is required. Okay, what if I send it as this? Okay, we get nothing back, right? And that's because we're not actually having the value listed here. So if we go to a value on the input and we'll say form.data.name because we returned data, right, as rest. And then we'll say otherwise nothing. And as you can see, as soon as I refresh the page, we see that here. So remember, data was being passed here. This is not the data that comes from a load function. This is our other data. So this is form.data, which contains all of the initial fields from the form data, all the initial values from our form data. So now if I resubmit this again, for example, and I just put H, it's going to give me H back. If I put nothing, it's going to show an error. So now let's go ahead and add this same error, essentially, or the same label to all of our individual fields here. So I'm just going to copy this and then I'm going to replace this span label on each one of these with the respective form errors dot whatever. So this is dot email. So I'm just replacing the, the name with email for password. I'll do the same thing here. And then for confirm, confirm password or password confirm, I always flip that around for some reason. And then lastly, for the X or terms. Now you can see, since I just submitted it, all these errors are still there. But if I refresh the page, let's just submit name is Hunter. We're only getting errors on these. If I accept the terms, you know, we're only getting errors on these three, okay? So we can go ahead and also add the value to each one of these fields as well of the ones that we're actually wanting to get back. And the only ones we want to get back are actually the email and the name because we want them to re-accept the terms and conditions. We also want them to re-add their password and confirm password, right? So under our email input, we'll go ahead and paste this here and we'll change this to email. So now if I type in an email, I'm getting that back still from the form and it's still showing error messages for these, which is great. So now what I wanna do, I wanna get a little bit more fancy here and I actually want to update the border of our inputs here to be read if there's an error as well. 
So what I can do is I can come into my name form here and you can see input borders is what's actually adding the border to my field. So what I can do is I can actually set up some brackets here and I'm going to say, I'm gonna wrap this in a string. I'm gonna say form dot errors dot name. Then we wanna show input error right? Because this is, if this is true, so if there's a form.errors.name, we want to show input dash error, else we want to show input bordered. And input error just changes the border to red. So now if I resubmit this form with no name, you'll see that not only do we get name is required, we also have the border changed to red. And then we can just copy this class for the remainder of the field as well. And we'll just change their names here. Okay, so you can see now that we're getting validation on all of these, if I refresh the page again to clear those out, I type in name and email. Now we only get errors for the password and confirm password, right? And then we can do something with the checkbox as well. It's a little bit different. So what we'll do is um, for the checkbox down here, where is it? Checkbox primary. We can just say form errors dot terms. Then we want to show order red or border error. I think we can use border error here. Okay, so now it's showing it there, but it's showing it by default. So if there's an error, we'll show the border error. Let's say border error, otherwise nothing. Okay, there we go. So now we have this red, we have all these fields, all these inputs red, if there is validation issues, right? So we're pretty much already done with the validation piece of this. Now, there's one more thing you may have a question about, and that is probably, okay, well, how do I check to see if my password and confirm password match without breaking you know, the structure of the errors? Now, obviously, you could add it to that array, but that would get a little bit messy. Um, so Zod actually offers something called Super Refine, which if I go into the documentation here again, and I look for Super Refine, let's first look at Refine. So Refine lets us provide custom validation logic via refinements. A super refine just gives us more control over that refinement, right? So it can take in a value as well as the context, and then you're able to add your own custom issues. So we're going to do that really quick to finalize this little validation project we're working on here. So let's go into our page.server.js, and then at the top here for our register schema object, we're going to add that super refine method. So we'll say that super refine. Remember, it takes in a value in the context, but we can actually destructure this and say we want the password confirm and the password, right? And then again, it also takes in the context as well. And then we will say if password confirm is not equal to password, then we want to ctx or context.add issue. And we're going to make an issue object. The code is going to be custom because it's our own custom issue. The message is going to be password and confirm password must match. And then the path is going to be the name of the field. So we'll just say password for this one. And then we'll just copy this. Whoops. Copy this one more time. And this one will be for the password confirm field. Okay. So let's go ahead and test that, test this out and see if it works as expected. So I'll fill everything in as expected, say password here. So I'm typing password and I'll type password one, two, three here. And then I'll accept this, right? So let's hit register. Now we can see that password and confirm password must match. So that validation is happening. So I think it's going to conclude this video. I hope it's been informative. I hope this kind of showed you how you can, you know, not only validate the input on the server, but also, you know, display useful UI information to the user so they know how to make corrections for their form submission to actually go through. So if you got value out of this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Don't forget to join the Discord server. If you have any questions, you can ask me them in there. And I will see you in the next video.